Uh, good evening and welcome to our time of worship this evening. We thank you for coming out and enjoying this nice, uh, comfortable weather as we continue to be prepared for Christmas. Uh, we continue the theme of uh, God sent a wild man uh, to prepare us for the Prince of Peace. And uh, so we'll see if we could get into the uh, message and the uh, things. Any particular announcements, Pastor Tom, that we have or that we know of? Okay. Why don't we then uh, begin with our opening hymn. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. As we approach Holy God, listen to his word from the prophet Isaiah in chapter 64. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, O Lord, that, that the, the mountains, mountains might quake at, at your, your presence. presence. From of old no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No, no eye, eye has seen, seen a God, God beside you. you. Who acts, who acts for those who wait, who wait for, for him. him. Behold, you were rightfully angry because of our sins. We, we have been, been in our sins, sins for a long time. time. Can, Can we be saved? saved? 
But now, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are the potter. We are all the work of your hands. Remove your anger from us, O Lord. We turn to you for mercy. Do not remember our sins. Fellow sinners, God indeed remembers his mercy. He hears our cries of repentance. He waits with arms that are opened in love. He has torn the heavens apart and sent his perfect son, Jesus, into our world to be our Savior. It is by his suffering and death that our sins are paid for. It is by his resurrection that he raises us up to new life. Our sins are indeed forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are forgiven. Thanks be to God, we pray. Stir up your power, O Lord. Turn, Turn our, our hearts, hearts of stone into, into hearts, hearts of love. love. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus, Jesus our Savior. Savior. Amen. Amen. Please be seated as we carefully listen to this gospel lesson. The gospel lesson for this evening is taken from the book of St. Luke's, beginning with chapter 1, verses 26 through 56. It says, The birth of Jesus foretold. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have, you have found, fa found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who has said to her that she was said to be barren in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. Then Mary visits Elizabeth. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill of Judah, where she entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come from me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is the one who believes that what the Lord had said to her will be accomplished. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been meanful, mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. 
holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arms. He has scattered those who are proud in their innermost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but he has lifted up the humble. He has lifted the hungered with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he has said to our father. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months, then returned home. This is the word of the gospel. Praise to you, O Christ. of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our text for this evening is on our screens. It comes from Matthew chapter 3. I invite you to join with me in reading it. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair, a leather belt about his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees, and every good tree that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. People of God, people whose faith is in Christ Jesus. As I stated before, the theme for our midweek Advent services this year is God sent a wild man uh, to prepare us for the Prince of Peace. About a year before Jesus began his teaching ministry, St. John the Baptizer burst upon the scene, and he really burst upon it in a wild way. First of all, his appearance was just uh, exceptionally wild. Uh, he was dressed like uh, the prophet Isaiah, or not the prophet Isaiah, the prophet Elijah, uh, some 850 years before 
John the baptizer was born. And he preached a wild message. He proclaimed a message that was very, very difficult to comprehend and wrap your head around. The message, God himself, the Almighty One, is on his way to be with his people. So prepare his way. So to give him smooth access into your lives so that he can come to you as quickly as possible. Remove every burial, every obstacle that interferes with his arrival into your hearts and into your lives. God himself is coming to be with you. Well, last week we looked at one of the obstacles that often block uh, his entrance into our lives. And we use the illustration of potholes. Uh, the pothole that we looked at last week was especially the pothole of hypocrisy. And hypocrisy is unfaithfulness. And it's our unfaithfulness that indeed hinders God's coming to be with us. Those potholes need to be filled with God's faithfulness. Tonight we look at boulders that get in the Lord's way especially the boulder of arrogance. Words have a way of making a changing over a, a number of years. Uh, pride is one of those words. Uh, in the past, pride was often listed as one of the seven deadly sins. And by a deadly sin, it was, means that it was referring to something that destroys faith and confidence in God. It's something to be avoided at all costs. But the word pride has taken a little bit different meaning uh, in our world. Uh, we can also use a word to describe something that can be helpful, uh, something that uh, accomplishes so, some good. And when we do something like that, when we have pride in what we have done, it's kind of like getting a high five or giving a high five to somebody else. That kind of sense of pride uh, can be a very good gift from God, especially when it encourages us to continue to live in ways that are pleasing to God. But most of the time, pride had the flavor of what we use today in the word arrogance. Arrogance. Arrogance is having an unreliable confidence in oneself. Uh, arrogance is a quality of extreme and foolish pride that uh, puts us on pretty dangerous paths. It places our confidence and trust in ourselves alone and above everything else. And so the common phrase that was taken from the scriptures is often used, or at least it was often used many years before, pride goes before a fall. That kind of arrogance eventually is going to fall and fall severely. And so as we use St. John the baptizer's call to prepare for the way of the Lord, we might use the illustration of boulders that get in the roadway, that block his coming to us. And arrogance definitely is a boulder that blocks God's purpose and his work and his presence in our lives. Because it creates hearts of stone and heads filled with rock. We see this kind of arrogance in some of the people who were coming out to John the baptizer. St. Matthew records that uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees were coming to see John. And the Sadducees and Pharisees kind of uh, stayed back for a bit and they watched as people uh, listen to John's message, as people confess their sins, uh, as people were baptized, and God was turning them back to himself. Uh, people that were being baptized were filled with the confidence of God's tremendous love for them. God, in his power, was changing their lives. But the Pharisees and Sadducees were a bit different. They were the religious leaders of the day. They saw what was happening. They saw God at work changing, renewing the lives of so many people. And what was the reaction of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? 
We don't need it. We don't need it. That's for those folks over there. We don't need to confess our sins. We don't need forgiveness. We have our genealogy. We trace our roots all the way back to Abraham. We don't need to change. We have Abraham as our ancestor. We trust our heritage. We trust our heritage. And so the Sadducees and the Pharisees rejected what God was doing. Their arrogance was like a huge boulder that blocked their faith and the only one who could truly save them. You see, they trusted their heritage rather than trusting the one who had given them their heritage. And so St. John is kind of interesting as uh, the way that St. John does this. But it's almost like St. John is saying, well, you want to trace your genealogy back? You stopped too quickly. You stopped at Abraham. Let me take you back to the Garden of Eden. Let me trace your genealogy, not back to Adam and Eve, but to the serpent, to Satan. Because you're deceiving yourselves. You are deceiving yourselves dangerously if you think you do not need the mercies of God. They trusted their heritage. Heritage. What a great heritage God has given us as Lutheran Christians. I am so thankful that I was able from the very beginning of my life to be raised within a Lutheran church, be able to understand the scriptures as taught by Lutheran teachers. We have a great heritage, the heritage of Martin Luther. We have the heritage of grace alone, God's abundant love that saves us. We have the heritage of faith alone, knowing that our works can never save us, that we must rely and trust on God and God alone for our salvation. We have the heritage of God's word as our authority, his word that assures us of his eternity for us and that continues to give us the guidance and direction that we need here in this world. We have the heritage of law and gospel. Yes, we have heritage, a great heritage. But what are we trusting? Our heritage or the one who gave us such a great heritage? We must understand that Satan can use even a great gift like a heritage, whether it be a spiritual heritage or a heritage as a nation. Satan can use even a good gift, twist it around, and produce terrible arrogance. Arrogance, confidence in ourselves rather than in God and His mercy. And so St. John warns us, the wild man gets in our face. He declares, don't be a blockhead. Don't have your head so full of rocks. Don't have your heart so stony that you can't see, that you cannot put your faith alone in your heritage. If you're interested in heritage, if God was interested in heritage, he could raise heritage from the rocks. Our heritage, fortunately, is a heritage that points us to Christ Jesus. Anything other than that is not accurate. I enjoy this painting from one of Luther's contemporaries. And in this particular painting of Martin Luther, it emphasizes that Luther receives the salvation that he receives from God, from Christ Jesus alone. And that's exactly what Luther wants to continue to do with his life and his ministry. His heritage points us to Christ Jesus. That's what our heritage is trying to do. But arrogance, arrogance in all of its forms, are a deadly sin. Uh, they uh, interfere with the power of God at work within us. The arrogance of the Sadducees and the Pharisees that we see in John the Baptizer's ministry that kept them from receiving the Lord himself. Now it's interesting to me that our world today produces 
a little bit different type of arrogance. The arrogance of the Pharisees and the Sadducees was an arrogance of their heritage. But today, our society has an arrogance based upon rejecting heritage, rejecting the past. Uh, what our society does today is, uh, is develop an, arity, an, an arrogance rather that's based upon a false religion, upon the idolatry of, I know what is best. I know what is best. And because we live in a society like that, that focuses itself and its hope and its confidence and its arrogance upon its own wisdom, we run into all kinds of problems and situations. Let me show an example of the arrogance that we find within our society. Millions of people for thousands of years have known that marriage consists between a relationship between a woman and a man. And our society has the audacity to say, all those people were wrong, dead wrong. They were all wrong. And our society has the audacity and the arrogance to say, we know what is best. We can change the definitions. We can make the rules that we want. It's an arrogance that's kind of opposite of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees and the Sadducees had an arrogance based upon their heritage and their tradition. The arrogance that we experience in our society today is an arrogance that is based upon rejecting religion and rejecting tradition, rejecting heritage, and placing ourselves and our intelligence at the top of the scale. Ironically, both of them wind up doing the same thing. They reject the authority of God. They reject the mercy of God. They throw boulders in God's way. Their heads are filled with rock. Their hearts are made of stone. Arrogance rejects humility. In fact, arrogance usually despises humility. And how does God come to us? In arrogance? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Instead, he comes to us in humility. God's desire is to be with us, his people. His desire is to be alive within us in our lives. And how did he accomplish this? How did God, the all-powerful one, the creator of the entire universe, the one whom the prophet Isaiah declares holds all the billions of galaxies within the palm of his hand, how did such one come to us? He accomplished his task to be with us in humility and humbleness. He became one of us, a flesh and blood person. Almighty God himself stepping into our world of sin, into our world of destruction, into our world that thinks it knows it all, a world that is so full of itself. What a contrast. The arrogance of ourselves, the humility of God. The arrogance of ourselves and the humility of the Almighty One, which is the true reality, which is really real and reliable, which is the authority. There were many people who listened to John the Baptizer, the wild man from the desert wilderness. There were many who understood his message and received his message, and they bowed before God. They confessed their sins, their unworthiness of his love. They depended upon God for the mercy they needed. They humbled themselves before God, and they discovered that God moved a boulder away. 
and Emmanuel, God himself, came to be with them. Emmanuel, God himself, came to be with them. The Pharisees and Sadducees, they refused to humble themselves before God. Their hearts of stone rejected what they needed and what God was offering them. They preferred trusting in their heritage rather than admit their need of God's mercy. And the Pharisees today continue to do the same thing. They refuse to humble themselves even before God. Their heads of stone reject what they need and what God offers. They prefer trusting in their wisdom, their intelligence, rather than to admit their need of God's mercy. Hearts of stone, heads filled with rocks, boulders that are thrown in God's way. And when we are confronted with such rocks and boulders, it all seems so overwhelming and so hopeless. About 50 years ago, a woman told me, it's impossible for people to change. She continued to tell me, she said, I believe that uh, by the time a person reaches 18, it's impossible for any real changes to be made in their attitudes and in their patterns of living. By the time a person reaches 18, their lives have been pretty well set in stone. There is no use of even trying to do anything about it. That was her perspective. Thankfully, St. John the Baptizer totally disagrees. St. John's message would be, never tell God what he cannot do. Never tell God what he cannot do. Never underestimate the power and the love of God. Some boulders need dynamite to blast them away, and thankfully God and his word are exactly that, a power to change stones into hearts, a power to raise children out of rocks, a power to change boulders into kindness and bold love. And that is precisely what happened within several years of St. John the Baptizer's ministry. The stony hearts, the rock-filled heads of many Pharisees and Sadducees were changed. We see that in the examples of Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. When we read through the book of Acts, we are told that numbers of Pharisees and many priests and Levites became believers and followers of Jesus Christ. They even became leaders of the early church, confessing their faith in Christ and calling others to join them in their faith. Hearts of stone, heads filled with rocks that could not stand against the power of God and his word of life in his son, Jesus Christ. Can people change? The more important question is this. Can I change? Can you change? St. John says, absolutely. And what's even more important, God through St. John says, yes, indeed. But you don't have the power to change yourself. You don't have the power to change yourself. But thankfully, the Almighty One does. He has the power to change us. And he makes those changes through his humility, his hum humbleness. Therefore, humble yourselves before the Almighty One. Bow before him and see his power that bulldozes the rocks and the boulders that block his way so that he can come and be within us. People of God, people whose trust and confidence is in God, but also fellow blockheads. Fellow blockheads. May God give us the confidence in that which is stronger than rock solid. Confidence in God's humility. Confidence in His undeserved love and mercy. Confidence in Him 
and his desire to be Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. Lord, we beg you, make it so. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We rise and we confess our faith as we uh, use the words of the explanation of the second article of the Creed. In the second article of the Apostles' Creed, our confession is focused on Jesus, whose coming we await. We speak the words of the Creed, followed by the What Does This Mean? section from the small catechism of Dr. Martin Luther. And in Jesus Christ, our only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And what does this mean? I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from all eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own, and live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he has risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity. This is most certainly true. In your prayers, we ask that you continue to pray for uh, Jack Steeb. Understand that uh, he has returned home from the hospital, remains in very critical condition. And so we uh, continue to pray for him. Marge Lidl also, who is now in hospice. We rejoice with uh, Oliver Wisniewski uh, as he continues to recover from surgery. We bow our heads to pray. <clears throat> Lord God, our Heavenly Father, sometimes it's so easy for us to lose sight and understanding of the power and the majesty that you have. Sometimes we see ourselves so overwhelmed with the problems that confront us, uh, whether they be problems that we face in this world, uh, whether it be problems that we have uh, as, as individuals, uh, problems of health or uh, finances or downsizing or, or uh, lock-ins or whatever it is that takes place. How easy it is for us to lose sight of the one who truly has power. You haven't promised to always change the world the way that we would like for it to be changed. But Lord, we thank you that you promised to forgive us and unlock us from our guilt. We thank you that you promised to give us strength for each step on our journey. We thank you that you promised that you have released us from the power of death and have provided eternal life for us. Give us the courage then to face each day, not on our own, but with you at our side, leading, guiding, and often carrying. So we come to you this evening, we thank of those who are battling difficult illnesses or injuries, those recovering from surgeries. We pray that you would continue to strengthen each one, especially with faith and confidence of your presence with them. Renew us in every way, O Lord. And so we commend ourselves into your care. Our Heavenly Father, who is the potter, we are the clay the one who reaches into our lives to shape and form us into the person that he wants us to be. And to your hands we commend ourselves. And together we pray, Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. blessings as you continue your evening and uh, rejoice in the Lord always.